In Chapter 3 we will deal with ligand binding assays. We will cover equilibrium binding and the scheduled analysis to determine the dissociation constant and the maximum number of binding sites Bmax. I will introduce you to different assay formats, the direct and competitive binding assays and the heterogeneous and homogeneous binding assays. Some time will be spent on antibodies which are indispensable for immunoassays and on receptor assays. The second half of this chapter will be about detection principles. How can the interaction between a ligand and a receptor or a ligand and an antibody be detected? Let's look at equilibrium binding. Equilibrium binding is actually very simple and you are quite familiar with the principle of a chemical equilibrium. P a receptor or an antibody is incubated with X a ligand forming a receptor or antibody ligand complex PX. This complex is formed with a certain equilibrium constant or affinity. Generally speaking antibodies have affinities in the nanomolar or 10 to the 9th molar range, but they can be stronger. Affinity constants for receptors vary much more widely since receptors are based on a much larger and wider range of protein structures, while antibodies are fairly similar in structure. To form this complex a certain time is also needed, so the receptor and or the antibody and the ligand need to be incubated for a certain time for equilibrium to be reached. Ligand binding assays are saturation binding assays. That means you cannot bind an infinite amount of ligand because there is only a finite amount of receptor or antibody available. Once all antibody or receptor have bound a ligand then you have reached saturation or as it is called in the scattered nomenclature you reached Bmax the maximum number of binding sites in the assay. As you can see from this curve, binding curve starts fairly steep because there is a large excess of antibody or receptor available and then asymptotically approaches Bmax. Bmax and the affinity constant are two very important parameters to char characterize a ligand binding assay. However, both are very difficult to extrapolate from a ligand binding saturation binding curve because the curve is not linear and Bmax is approached asymptotically that means actually at infinitely high concentration of X the ligand. This has led Mr. Sketchard to propose a transformation of these data to linearize them. The basis for a Sketchard analysis is an equilibrium between the immobilized antibody or receptor and the ligand here called the antigen X. P plus X is an equilibrium with the complex PX. The equilibrium constant KD can be described as KD equals PX divided by P times X. If P0 is the total amount of immobilized antibody in the assay, then P0 equals Bmax in the scattered nomenclature. That means that the free amount of antibody P is the difference between P0, the total amount that is present, minus Px, the amount of antibody that has formed a complex. If we now replace P by P0 minus Px in the equilibrium equation, then we establish a relationship between Px divided by X and KD. Px divided by X is KD times P0 minus KD times Px. If we now make a plot, a so-called scattered plot of Px divided by X against Px, we will obtain a straight line with S slope minus KD. It is thus very easy now to either graphically or through calculation determine KD. The scattered plot also allows to determine Bmax, 
Consider that you add more and more ligand to the assay so that all binding sites in the assay or all antibodies are occupied. That means that the concentration of ligand X is much larger than the number of complexes Px which will approach Bmax as we have seen before. Once all sites are occupied then Bmax has been reached and Px divided by X has approached zero. That means X is much much larger in infinitesimally large and Px is a constant. It is clear that Bmax can never be reached as it is asymptotically approached so you need to extrapolate a little bit the straight line of a scattered plot to zero. If you have a plot Px divided by x against Px, thus the scattered plot, and you extrapolate the line to zero, this cutting point will be Bmax. Let's look at the scattered plot of the data that we've looked at before. Remember the scattered transformation plots Px divided by x against Px. And as you can see, you obtain a reasonably straight line with the square of a correlation coefficient of 0 0.9882. Please refer back to the biostatistics course for the meaning of the correlation coefficient. This means that the data can be reasonably well fitted to a straight line. The slope of this line gives you the dissociation constant or affinity constant as 6.46 .6 nanomolar to the minus 1. The cutting point with the x-axis is Bmax, because that's when Px divided by x is zero, as x approaches infinity. Bmax in this case is 0 0.13 nanomolar. You can see from this transformation that it is fairly easy to either graphically or by calculation obtain the dissociation constant Kd and the maximum number of binding sites Bmax from a scattered plot. There are principally two ways to perform binding assays in practice. First is the direct assay and second the competitive assay. In the direct assay you have a somewhat labeled ligand that binds to an antibody or receptor B. The star expresses the label and as the binding occurs, a signal is generated which can be directly measured. We will see later on which detection principles can be used for this kind of assay. In a competitive assay, you have a ligand that is labeled, again forming this complex, but what you would like to measure is the ligand A in the sample. This is quite convenient as you do not have to label your ligand in the sample, which is often quite com uh, complicated because samples are very complex. In this case, ligand A from the sample displaces part of the labeled ligand A star and you have two complexes, one giving a signal A star B and the other one giving no signal A B. This means the more ligand is in your sample, the higher its concentration, the lower the signal. This is a general trend for competitive assays. The signal goes down, gets lower, as the concentration of your analyte increases in the sample. This can be seen, some real data, on this plot. A recombinant form of the dopamine D2 receptor was immobilized and incubated with different ligands, starting with the high affinity binder spiperone to the rather low affinity binder dopamine itself. You can see the competitive binding curves. In the beginning, when there is no ligand present, the binding is 100%. What I should say is that we used as a tracer radioactively labeled spiperone. So radioactively labeled spiperone is displaced and the signal, the radioactive signal in this case, decreases via a sigmoidal curve reaching zero.
For spipyrone itself, as a high affinity binder, we reach zero at about 10 to the minus 6 molar. And the IC50, that means the value where 50% of the tracer ligand, the radioactive ligand, have been displaced, is around 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 molar. 1 to 10 nanomolar. As we go down the line to lower affinity ligands, butaclamol, haloperidol and sulpiride, you can see that this IC50 value shifts to the right to higher concentrations. Competitive binding assays are thus also very good to compare the binding affinity of different molecules to a receptor or an antibody. This is often used in drug discovery to see whether newly synthesized receptor ligands have higher or lower affinity and whether they are competitive. Interestingly, the endogenous li ligand dopamine has a very low affinity so that the IC50 value cannot even be reached due to solubility problems in the assay. Another way of discriminating how ligand binding assays are performed is in the heterogeneous or homogeneous format. Here we see an example of a heterogeneous ligand binding assay. A receptor R is incubated with a labeled, let's say radioactively labeled ligand, as shown before. After the incubation, some of the ligand is bound to the receptor while some remains free in solution. Since both ligands are radioactive, whether bound or not, it is impossible to discriminate whether a ligand is bound or free based on the emitted radioactivity. It is thus necessary to implement a separation step. Such a separation step may be based on size because the receptor or antibody are much bigger than the free ligand. We've already heard about such separation steps when looking at drug-protein interactions. For example, we can use ultrafiltration through a membrane that excludes molecules larger than 10,000 Dalton. As most or let's say all receptors and antibodies are bigger than 10,000 Dalton, the bound ligand to the receptor will be retained while the free ligand will be found in the filtrate. It is thus easy to measure radioactivity in the retentate in the filtrate and thus to discriminate how much ligand is bound and how much ligand is still free in solution. Homogeneous or mix and measure assays have gained a lot in popularity during recent years as they are so easy to execute. However, they are rather complicated to set up, so the effort is in the setting up of the assay and then it's easy to use it. But how does it work? It's very simple, also called mix and measure assays. You have a receptor, or an antibody and a ligand, you incubate, you form the complex and you can directly measure the signal after equilibrium has been reached. As only the bound ligand receptor or bound ligand antibody complex will generate a signal while the free ligand will not. How this is possible will be explained later in the section on detection principles. These mix and measure assays are used a lot in the pharmaceutical industry for high throughput screening. For example, when you have to screen thousands, hundreds of thousands or even millions of compounds to find hits and thus to develop new pharmaceuticals. Immunoassays are the most widely used ligand binding assays. This is largely due to the fact that antibodies can be generated against most molecules of interest, be it low molecular weight drugs or biopharmaceuticals or biomarkers. In this part of the lecture you will learn briefly how antibodies are generated. It is assumed that you already have a background in immunology and know how principally the immune system works. A peculiarity for low molecular weight pharmaceuticals like synthetic drugs is that they do not elicit an immune response by themselves. This is very good obviously because otherwise we would develop antibodies against ibuprofen and paracetamol which would prevent us from taking them 
again at a later stage. In order to get antibodies against low molecular weight molecules in synthetic drugs, drug protein conjugates must be prepared because our immune system, or the immune system in general of animals, has been optimized to recognize foreign proteins. It should be kept in mind that antibodies recognize only a small part of the target molecule, the so-called epitope. This is particularly critical in the case of proteins, because we often say we measure a protein with a ligand binding assay, but what we really do is we only measure a small part of the protein. If this protein is modified at another place, we will not be able to realize and see that using a ligand binding assay that does not recognize this part. Proteins such as biopharmaceuticals and biomarkers elicit an immune response. However, they must be injected into species or different species from where they come from. For example, if you want to have an antibody against the human protein, you would have to raise the antibodies in another species such as a rat or a rabbit. If you would like to have an antibody against the biopharmaceutical which resembles a human protein, you must select antibodies that can discriminate the endogenous molecule from the recombinant biopharmaceutical. We will see later more about that also in the section on biopharmaceuticals. Specificity is a critical attribute in ligand binding assays, as detection is indirect. That means you will get a fluorescent or colored signal or radioactivity binding, but you do not get any chemical information. That means if the antibody recognizes another protein or another molecule that is related, you will not be able to discriminate the signal based on one molecule from that based on the other interfering molecule. This has recently led to many discussions in the field of bioanalysis questioning, questioning the specificity of many commercially available antibodies. Let's do just a little bit of organic chemistry. We would like to make antibodies against the blood pressure regulator propanolol by coupling it to the protein BSA, bovine serum albumin. However, this cannot be achieved directly since propanonol does not contain any activated groups for coupling. We thus need to derivatize propanolol first. We can do that by reacting it with succinic anhydride to make an ester and introduce a carboxylic acid group into the molecule. This carboxylic acid group can subsequently be activated with isobutyl chloroformate to generate an activated tertiary butyl ester. Bovine serum albumin contains many free primary amine groups which can easily react with an activated ester, in this case on propanolol, to form a propanolol BSA conjugate via an amide bond. Now you have a propanolol BSA conjugate that can be injected into animals such as rabbits to generate antibodies. This slide, taken out of a very a widely used book of immunology, shows what kind of antibodies you can expect from such an immunization. First of all, you can expect antibodies against the carrier, that would be bovine serum albumin. You can, if you use a different carrier, you would expect antibodies against that carrier protein. These would be simply antibodies against the carrier protein and not against your drug. If you would inject your drug like propanonol by itself, you would get no antibodies whatsoever since a propanonol is not immunogenic and our immune system cannot recognize it, or in this case the immune system of the rat. If you inject a conjugate, it's often called a haptin carrier conjugate, with protein 1, let's say bovine serum albumin, you will get antibodies against bovine serum albumin and antibodies against the drug, because the drug will be presented in the context of the protein so that our immune system or the immune system of the rat can recognize it. The same would go if you use a different carrier protein. You would get antibodies against that carrier protein and the drug. Now it is important to screen amongst the many antibodies that are generated those 
that recognize the molecule of interest, in this case propanolol. Immunizing animals with an antigen, a protein or a protein drug conjugate, generates a myriad of different antibodies, some specific, some non-specific, some with high and some with lower affinity, some cross-reactive to other similar molecules and maybe some not. It is thus very hard to get a reproducible so-called polyclonal antiserum or polyclonal antibodies. Each immunization may give you a different batch with a different quality. This has resulted in difficulties in reproducing ligand binding assays based on polyclonal antibodies. With the advent of the hybridoma technology it is now possible to generate defined and single sequence antibodies, so-called monoclonal antibodies that you have likely already heard about. The technology of monoclonal antibodies, which was awarded the Nobel Prize to Milstein and Köhler, um, is based on fusion of cells. If we look through the eight steps that will bring us to a monoclonal antibody, the beginning is actually exactly the same as for polyclonal antibodies. First, an animal, in this case a mouse, is immunized with the antigen, for example a protein drug conjugate. However, subsequently the B cells, means the antibody producing cells, are isolated from the spleen and put into culture. The major problem why this was not done before is that B cells cannot grow in culture outside the environment of the spleen, as they need continuous stimulation. Milstein and Kurla found out that by fusing B cells with a cancer cells, myeloma cells or cancer cell line, you create so-called hybridoma cells. That means B cells still producing antibodies but growing more or less indefinitely in culture. This is thus a critical step to have a continuously producing B cell line um, based on the immunization. However, there are many different B cells and as said before, some may make antibody that is suitable for the assay and others may not. So how to find out which are the good B cells, the appropriate ones, or should I say hybridoma cells, and which ones are no good? The step for, th for this is to isolate clones. This is fairly simply by just separating cells from cell culture into single cells. Cells can be seen under the microscope and the selection can be done in automated systems. Once cells have been separated into single clones, each clone can be grown up again into multiple cells, secreting each one a different antibody and then the secreted antibodies can be screened for the purpose at hand, for example for developing an immunoassay. It is also important to say that this kind of technology is also used to produce the modern generation of biopharmaceuticals, monoclonal antibodies blocking or activating a given receptor, for example. Once the screening is finished, and this is often done in robotic systems since there can be hundreds of thousands of cells, uh, the appropriate clones are then taken and frozen down and can be multiplied in culture. This is usually done nowadays in vitro, that means in cell culture, in batch cell culture or in immobilized cells, and the antibody can be continuously harvested. In this way, you have a continuous and renewable source of monoclonal antibody of consistent quality. In the older days, it was possible to grow these cells, or difficult, sorry, to grow these cells into large batches, and the cells were re-injected into the mouse, creating a local tumor, and from that tumor, a cytis fluid was isolated, containing the monoclonal antibody, which was then isolated. This is not done anymore today. I've already referred a lot to antibodies, so let's look at the antibody structure in a schematic view. An antibody of the immunoglobulin G family, which is the family used for assays but also for biopharmaceuticals, has a very conserved structure 
which makes it actually very ideal to develop essays as uh, not each time a new expression system has to be optimized. An IgG is composed of two chains, a heavy chain in dark green and a light chain in light green. Both chains make up the antigen binding site, or in our context we could say the ligand binding site, as indicated above. So you have two binding sites, two identical binding sites per antibody molecule. Chains are linked together by dual disulfide bridges, which can be cleaved by reducing agents. On the constant part of the antibody at the bottom, we have the effector functions, because antibodies in life should induce the immune response and should protect the organism, for example, from infections, but also from transformed cells and tumor development. To this end, the constant part is glycosylated, for example, to stimulate immune cells. This is not so relevant in the context of developing an immunoassay. Rather, the constant region is used to generate a signal in an immunoassay. That means antibodies raised against the constant region, for example, anti-mouse or anti-rat an antibodies, are used, coupled to an enzyme, for example, which is then incubated with a substrate to generate a signal. We will see more about how signals are generated in immunoassays in the part on detection principles. An antibody has about 150,000 Dalton in total molecular weight, so it is a fairly large protein that is also quite heterogeneous when it comes to glycosylation and other post-translational modifications. It should just thus be never forgotten that in an immunoassay we deal with rather complex biological reagents and that the quality of these reagents has to be carefully checked to develop a reproducible and robust assay. That antibodies do not recognize the entire antigen is depicted in this picture taken from a book. Here we see the antibody, blue in its uh, well-known Y shape, attacking a virus. The virus is much bigger than the antibody and the virus capsid is composed of proteins. The antibody with its two binding sites recognizes parts of these proteins, the so-called epitopes, and binds to the virus. In a true immune reaction, the constant part of the antibody would no, now elicit an immune response and the immune system would try to eliminate the virus. In the case of immunoassays, we simply use the constant part to generate a signal for detection of the virus. Immunoassays are very widely used to detect infectious agents, be it viruses or bacteria. Developing receptor assays requires, obviously, receptors. This is another story, because the family of receptors is much larger and much more diverse than the family of antibodies. When I say diverse, I don't mean just the binding sites, but the whole molecular structure. While antibodies all have the nice Y shape, with a, with a constant region, a heavy chain and a light chain, Receptors can be soluble, like nuclear receptors, like steroid receptors, and many of them are membrane-bound, which makes it very difficult to produce and isolate them, even by recombinant DNA technology. Nevertheless, while in the past receptors were often isolated from natural materials like brain, animal brain tissue, nowadays recombinant DNA technology is the method of choice to produce receptors. But as said before, this is by no means easy and receptor assays are thus much less often used than immunoassays. You might ask yourself, why should I use a receptor if I can use an antibody that's much more easy to make? Well, receptor assays have some advantages. Because receptor assays measure the truly active, pharmacologically active molecule. Because the molecule binds to a receptor, remember the dopamine D2 receptor, it elicits a biological response, either agonistic or antagonistic. If a molecule binds to an antibody, this is simply a tool and does not at all mean that this molecule is active or inactive. Due to the difficulty of producing receptors, 
active receptors are often used in semi-purified form in some kind of membrane enriched fraction. This means one has to be very careful with receptor assays not to observe non-specific binding. Here is an example of a soluble receptor. The receptor for the hormone progesterone. You can see the small molecule progesterone in the binding side of the receptor and you can see the complicated three-dimensional structure of this receptor. The progesterone receptor once bound to uh, its ligand will go to the nucleus and initiate a program of gene transcription. That is the function of the receptor. If you want to use it for a receptor assay we would, for example, have to use a labeled progesterone molecule and develop a competitive binding assay, for example, based on radioactively labeling progesterone as a tracer. The majority of receptors is membrane bound and thus much more difficult to isolate or even to produce in recombinant DNA form. Here we see a typical G-protein coupled receptor, so-called GPCR, with seven transmembrane regions. This shows that good part of the protein is actually embedded in the phospholipid phospho bilayer. It has an intracellular and an extracellular part. Naturally, the extracellular part is where the ligand binds, and then a signal is transmitted to the inside of the cell through the transmembrane regions and the intracellular part. In some instances it is possible to just express the extracellular ligand binding domain of a receptor in order to develop an assay. However, most often this is difficult because this small part of the receptor is structurally not stable and does not show the same binding properties as the proper receptor in its membrane lipid environment. Recombinant receptors can be prepared in different heterologous expression systems starting from bacteria all the way to mammalian cells. Bacteria are easy to grow, but they have a lot of disadvantages when it comes to receptor preparations. They cannot do most of the post-translational modifications that may be important for receptor activity and binding. They do not have endogenous G proteins, like uh, for G protein coupled receptors. They may not provide the proper membrane environment for correct protein folding and membrane insertion, leading to receptors that are not active. Also, the different membrane lipid composition in bacteria is a disadvantage. Advantages are obviously the low cost of growing bacteria, protein homogeneity that can be achieved, the rapid growth with a generation time of 20 minutes and the ease of plasmid construction. Bacteria like E. coli are thus preferred expression hosts, but often they are not appropriate to express mammalian receptors. One can then move on to the next higher level, which is a eukaryote, a simple eukaryote yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, or others like Picia pastoris. They still grow fairly rapidly, with a generation time of two hours. They still require simple and not expensive media. They can be easily scaled up to fermentation scale, that means to multiple liters. They grow in high cell densities and they can do some post-translational modifications, although most of them are not identical to what happens in mammalian cells. Cell lysis is difficult because yeast has a cell wall that needs to be broken first. Yeast has a low cholesterol content, that means its lipid, lipid composition, membrane composition, is very different from mammalian cells, and it has a low number of endogenous G proteins, thus not providing the ideal environment for the expression of active mammalian receptors. Insect cells are an intermediate step, as the expression vector can be introduced with a virus, baculovirus. These insect cells can do many post-translational modifications as they resemble much more mammalian cells. Protein folding is often correct and membrane insertion is possible. They have endogenous G proteins, but are still relatively easily grown in large amounts. However, as they are higher cells, they grow more slowly. Media are complex and somewhat expensive. <coughs> 
Proteins may be heterogeneous due to post-translational modifications, which is actually the case also for the natural receptors. They still have a low abundance of cholesterol and a limited number of endogenous G-coupled proteins. This is why most receptors are expressed nowadays in mammalian cells. This can be Chinese hamster ovary cells, HEC293 cells or COS7 cells. These cells can be grown to fairly large quantities. They can perform complex post-translational modifications. They contain the endogenous G proteins. Their membrane lipid composition is comparable to the natural environment of the receptor, thus providing an environment for correct protein folding and membrane insertion, and thus a higher chance of getting active receptor. However, they are difficult to scale up. I would say nowadays m many much progress has been made, so this difficulty has diminished. They require complex culture media that are expensive. They grow slowly and they also lead to heterogeneous proteins. So that means that activity may not be easy to reproduce. At the end, it is important now to also pay attention to the expression levels on the right. Even in mammalian cells, we are dealing with very low expression levels. You see 0.2 to 200 picomole per milligram of total protein. This is about the same for all the expression hosts, meaning that receptors can generally not be expressed at very high levels, so that means that their production is fairly expensive. A wide range of detection principles have been developed for measuring ligand binding assays, so the interaction between a ligand and an antibody or a ligand and a receptor. We already heard about radioactivity, which was the classical way of measuring uh, binding of a ligand to a receptor. However, as you may imagine, in recent years there is less and less interest in radioactive ligand binding assays because of the uh, associated risk and also the cost involved with disposing radioactive waste. Many other principles have thus been developed, ranging from colorimetric light absorption, enzyme multiplied immunoassay techniques, simple mix and measure technique, chemoluminescence, fluorescence and fluorescence energy transfer, fluorescence polarization and surface plasmon resonance, an online system. We will go through all of these briefly in this section of the, of the lecture. The radiochemical detection of ligand binding assays requires radioisotopes. In this table you see five of the most widely used radioisotopes. Carbon-14, tritium, iodine-125, sulfur-35 and phosphorus-32. Each of them has different properties. Carbon-14 has a very long half-life. That means that the contamination with carbon-14 will last for a very long time so you have to be very careful, as you have to be with all of them, obviously. Its radiation is not so strong, it is beta radiation, so you do not need to wear or have any special protection. Trithium falls into the same category. It's also a beta emitter with a fairly long half-life. For these two radioisotopes, it's just very critical not to ingest any of them because they cannot be detected from the outside of the body and obviously unless excreted they may stay around for a long time. Iodine 125 is very different, it's a gamma emitter thus you need to protect yourself from the gamma rays with uh, for example lead glass, glass and similar things. However it can be easily detected with a Geiger counter if contaminated in the lab. Sulfur-35 and Phosphorus-32 are somewhere in between. They have not such a long half-life, thus they emit quite a lot of energy over time. They are beta emitters and can be detected with a Geiger counter. Detection in an assay can be with liquid scintillation counting. That means that beta particles are emitted, are absorbed by molecules, organic molecules, that emit a light flash each time a beta particle hits, so-called scintillation. There are systems that count the number of light flashes per minute, for example. They can also be detected by liquid chromatography with a radioactivity detector at the end of the column. 
This can be very useful if, for example, separations have to be performed prior to the measurement. Some of them can also be detected by autoradiography. For example, you can incubate a sample with a radioactive ligand and then see to which proteins these ligands have bound, for example, on a proteomic scale after gel electrophoresis and then exposing them to a film or to a, a corresponding camera. The unit of uh, quantification is the Becquerel BQ. A Becquerel is simply one disintegration per second. That means one light flash, for example, in a scintillation counter per second. The specific activity of radioisotopes is measured in Becquerel per mole. The higher this specific activity, the higher the sensitivity, ultimately, of the radio assay. Let's take one more look at the radio receptor assay we alluded to earlier. It's a competitive assay where the radio labeled spiperone, a ligand of the dopamine D2 receptor, is competed out by unlabeled molecules, ligands for this receptor, like sulpiride, butaclamol, haloperidol, and dopamine itself. Without going into detail again, remember the sigmoidal competition curves. We start at 100% binding and ending up in 0% binding in a de concentration dependent manner. This is by definition a heterogeneous assay. A heterogeneous assay means that you have to separate bound from free ligand, for example by ultrafiltration, protein precipitation or dialysis. A more modern principle is based on the enzyme multiplied immunoassay technique, abbreviated EMIT. This is based on the transformation of a substrate to a product by an enzyme drug conjugate. If you look at the top of this slide, you see a substrate is entering the active site of the enzyme. You see the drug conjugate next to the active site. And then it is uh, transformed into a product and a signal is detected. At the bottom, you see an antibody blocking the active site because the antibody reacts to the drug enzyme conjugate. As the antibody is very big, as we've seen before, it blocks access of the substrate to the active site and thus no product will be formed. If now you have a lot of drug in your sample, a high concentration, then the antibody will bind to the free drug and cannot bind to the enzyme drug conjugate. So the, uh, so the active site is open and product is formed. That means a high concentration of your ligand in the sample will lead to a lot of product formation. If there is a low concentration in your sample, then the antibody will bind to the enzyme drug conjugate and block the active site, so no product is formed and there will be a low signal. This mix and measure principle emit is often used in toxicological analysis where a fast response is needed. Take a urine sample and mix it with the antibody and the enzyme drug conjugate. After mixing, you add the substrate, the enzyme creates the product which is colored and this is measured in a spectrophotometer. The whole assay can, uh, can be done in a few minutes if not less, and it can be easily automated. All it takes is mixing urine, the antibody and the drug conjugate, and then adding the substrate. If there is a lot of drug or toxic substance in the urine, then the antibody will be competed out from the enzyme drug conjugate, and a lot of product and a lot of signal will be formed. If there is a very low concentration of the drug, then there will be very little signal formed, as explained just before. In this example, we see the calibration curve of an emit assay for morphine. You can see the increasing emit units or signal produced with an increasing concentration. We should, however, remember that all the specificity of this assay depends on the specificity of the antibody for the enzyme drug conjugate and the drug.
That means while we see a signal, and the assay is fairly simple to execute, its quality depends entirely on proper assay development and on the control of the specificity of the antibody and obviously also on the diligent preparation of the enzyme drug conjugate. Much effort has gone into the development of emit assays for a number of substances that are regularly measured opiates, methadone, barbituric acid and its derivatives, amphetamines and cocaine metabolites. Each assay takes quite some effort to develop and this is only worthwhile if there will be many assays performed and assays where the response is f has to be fast. All these assays have been validated. You can see the 95% confidence limit and the cutoff values in detection sensitivity. So emit assays are mix and measure assays that are difficult and take some time to develop. They are easy to perform even by somewhat less trained personnel and they give a fast response. But on the other hand, this is only worthwhile to commercialize these assays if there is enough demand for them. The enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, is probably the most widely used format for performing ligand-binding assays. ELISAs can be performed in different ways, for example in a competitive format. In this format, a specific antibody is immobilized onto a microtiter plate and the sample is added to the wells of this plate. In the sample you add a fixed amount of your drug enzyme conjugate and this binds to the antibody together with the free drug in your sample. You thus have com competition between the conjugate and the free drug just like in a regular competitive assay. Later the plate is washed and the substrate is added. The enzyme con converts this substrate into an intense signal generating product, for example a colored molecule. The more color you see, the lower the concentration of G in your sample, as is typical for a competitive assay. If you have a higher concentration of G, less of the G enzyme conjugate will be bound to the antibody on the plate and you will receive a low signal because there is little substrate converted into product by the immobilized enzyme. As you can see, although it is an easily performed assay, it is a heterogeneous assay because you need to separate free ligand from bound ligand. When it comes to measuring proteins such as biopharmaceuticals or biomarkers, the sandwich format of the ELISA is the most widely used one. The sandwich format makes use of two antibodies. Antibody 1 is the capturing antibody with specificity for the protein of interest, for example a biomarker. This is bound to the plate and the non-bound proteins are washed away. Second, a second antibody, the detecting antibody coupled to an enzyme is added and this one binds to another epitope on the macromolecule to form the sandwich. You can understand that this will only work for larger molecules such as proteins because you need two different epitopes. One for capturing antibody 1 and another one that does not interfere with epitope 1 for the detecting antibody 2 coupled to the enzyme. Detection is done as generally by a substrate that is converted to a fluorescent, colored or otherwise detectable product. The signal increases with the concentration of G. That means it is directly proportional and not inversely like for a competitive ELISA assay. There is a wide range of enzyme substrates to detect in ligand binding assays. First of all colorimetric substrates. These are also called chromogenic substrates. They are turned into colored products by a given enzymes. We will see an example of that chemoluminescence substrates. These are very sensitive detection methods because light is generated during the enzymatic conversion from substrate to product. Finally you have fluorescent substrate or better to speak profluorescent substrates. The substrate itself is non-fluorescent but the product after enzymatic conversion is fluorescent.
Below you see an example of a chromogenic substrate for alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is an enzyme that's frequently used in ELISA assays to turn a substrate into a colored product. Paranitrophenol phosphate, the substrate, is non-colored, while the product, paranitrophenolate, is colored due to the conjugation with the paranitro group. Substrates, where the reaction is connected to the generation of light, are called chemoluminescent substrates. Luminol and luciferin are two widely used examples. <coughs> Luminol is turned into its product by peroxidase in the presence of hydrogen peroxide under the release of nitrogen and water. You see the chemical reactions on the upper level. As the product is formed it is in, ex in an excited state and as it transits down to a lower energy state it emits light. This is a very sensitive way of detecting this conversion. Luciferin is converted by the enzyme luciferase under the use of ATP, which is transformed to AMP and oxygen, into a product under the emission of light with the release of hydrogen carbonate. This reaction is well known from the firefly, which lights in the night, due to this, uh, this uh, chemical conversion happening in the fly. Fluorescence is another very sensitive way of detecting substrate to product conversion. Below we see the non-fluorescent substrate, which is a galactose conjugate of a coumarin, that can be converted by the enzyme galactosidase to the fluorescent coumarin product. In fact, fluorescence is such an important detection principle that we would like to spend a few minutes on explaining its principles. Fluorescence is first of all based on the absorption of a photon to excite usually an organic molecule from a ground state S0 to an excited state. This is shown in the equation below. As the electron returns from the excited state back to the ground state, photons are emitted. The relation or the ratio between photons absorbed and photons emitted is called the quantum yield. If the quantum yield is 1 or 100%, then one photon is emitted for every photon that is absorbed. This is rarely reached in reality, but modern fluorescent dyes get very close to the 100% limit. A sensitive fluorescent dye or label thus should have a high extension co extinction coefficient, that means it should absorb much light or a lot of photons. And on the other hand, a high quantum yield, that means it should emit a lot of light for every photon absorbed. That means for every photon absorbed, it should emit as close to one photon as possible. Extinction coefficient and quantum yield are determined by the structure of the fluorescent label or fluorescent dye. Below you see a diagram showing the principle of fluorescence. As mentioned before, photons are absorbed by a molecule and electrons are excited from a ground state S0 to excited states S1 and S2. They then descend back to the first excited state S1 from various vibrational excited states and then back to the ground state as zero with emission of light which we detect as fluorescence. You can see the time scales of excitation and emission. As electrons lose energy when going back to S1, the wavelength of fluorescence is always longer than the wavelength of the exciting light. This together with the fact that fluorescence is measured at the right angle from the exciting light, which is usually very strong, assures that there is little to no overlap between exciting light and emitted fluorescence, which makes this a very 
sensitive detection principle as the background is very low. There's a wide range of fluorescent labels of fluorescent dyes and a few are given in this table. They are characterized by their absorption and emission wavelengths, their quantum yield, their extinction coefficients, their molecular weight, the solubility and certain properties, for example their stability or their sensitivity to pH. Please take a look at this table and decipher the different properties of the molecules. For example, you see side dyes with very high extinction coefficients but very low quantum yield. On the other hand, you see Alexa fluor dyes on the top with a somewhat lower or intermediate extinction coefficient but with a very high quantum yield. You see molecules with very small Stokes shifts, that means a shift between the exciting light wavelength and the emission light wavelength, like the Bodipi dyes. And you see others that have large Stokes shifts. You also see molecules of the older generations like fluorescein, which are not very stable. This is called photobleaching. That means if you shine a light at them for longer periods of time, they will use their fluorescent properties as they are photochemically degraded. There are whole books about fluorescent labels and how they work, so this gives only a small glimpse of what is possible. Let's take a look how the fluorescence detection principle can be used to set up homogeneous assays. The first assay format is the fluorescence polarization assay. In this assay, light is passed through a so-called polarizer filter and it is polarized in one plane, in this case the vertical plane. This polarized light then passes through the sample compartment where the assay is taking place and is partially depolarized. We will see in a minute how. And then analyzed in a filter that is perpendicular to the polarizer filter called the analyzer. So only depolarized light will pass through the analyzer as all the initially vertically polarized light cannot pass through the horizontally polarized analyzer filter and reach the detector. So the more light is depolarized, the stronger the signal on the detector using this particular configuration of the polarization assay analyzer. This scheme shows the principle of fluorescence polarization or better to say fluorescence depolarization. As said before, first normal depolarized light is polarized through an excitation filter, in this case in the vertical direction. This light passes through the sample solution. Let's assume we have a fluorescent peptide as our tag to measure competition with a compound for binding to a receptor. If there is a lot of compound in the sample, then it will displace the fluorescent tag <coughs> in this case a peptide. And this is a small molecule that is fast tumbling and thus depolarizes light considerably. If the peptide is bound, so if there is little compound in solution, then there will be little depolarization because the molecules tumble rather slowly. <coughs> Remember, fluorescence happens on the nanosecond time scale between excitation and emission. If a molecule moves considerably during that time scale, there is much depolarization. If it uh, moves a little, because it's bound to a big and heavy molecule like an antibody or receptor, there is little depolarization. If we now put the polarization emission filter after the sample compartment in the same direction in this case, we will see a high signal if the peptide or the fluorescent tag is bound to the protein, so there is little depolarization. However, if there is much depolarization, less light will go through the emission filter and we will see a lower signal. This is the principle of the fluorescence polarization assay, which is a homogeneous mix and measure assay. Another assay format, Förster or fluorescence resonance energy transfer, 
shortly FRET, is based on the proximity of two molecules. It forms, it's a member of the large family of proximity assays. Here in this scheme we see a green molecule bound to a piece of DNA in close proximity to a red molecule. If exciting light of green wavelength excites the green molecule, it emits fluorescence which excites the red molecule which in its turn remits, emits red fluorescence. Red fluorescence can only be seen if green and red molecules are in close proximity, meaning on the order of 10 nanometers, because otherwise the orbitals would not be overlapping and there would be no further resonance energy transfer. That means both molecules must be bound to the same macromolecule, for example a receptor or an antibody, or in this case DNA. As shown in this figure, resonance energy transfer is exquisitely sensitive to the distance between the molecules. If the distance is less than 2 nanometers between the acceptor and the donor molecule, then you get full energy transfer. 50% energy transfer is reached about at a distance of 5 nanometers in this case while at 10 nanometers distance there is no energy transfer at all anymore. FRET is thus also a very powerful tool to measure distances between molecules and it is not only used in assay development. It is for example also used in structural studies and in studying conformational changes in proteins. In this schematic we see how FRET can be used to measure the interaction between a receptor and a ligand. The receptor is indirectly labeled with a fluorescent antibody. This is done to avoid having to label the receptor directly. As you may remember, receptors are difficult proteins to produce and even more difficult to label and keep in an active form. That is why often for assay development we resort to labeling the antibody. The ligand is directly labeled with fluorophore 1. In situation 1 where there is no binding, there is no resonance energy transfer and thus no signal. When binding occurs, the two fluorophores come in close proximity of less than 10 nanometers. So if fluorophore 1 is excited, energy will be transferred to fluorophore 2, who will then emit light. This is situation 2. This forms the basis of a FRET assay, which is a homogeneous mix and measure assay. A recently developed methodology called surface plasmon resonance, or SBR, allows to measure the interactions between a ligand and a receptor, in this case, in real time. That means it can measure the kinetic constants of the on and the off rate and based on the ratio of the two measure also the dissociation constant. So far all the assays that I've discussed work at the equilibrium. That means you have to wait until equilibrium is established while this assay works under flow conditions. It's actually based on a microfluidic chip in which the ligand is immobilized in this case and the receptor flows over the surface. As you can see the chip is made of glass covered with a thin layer of gold. When polarized light is shone through a prism on a sensor chip with a thin metal film on top as shown here, the light will be reflected by the metal film acting as a mirror. On changing the angle of incidence and monitoring the intensity of the reflected light, the intensity of the reflected light passes through a minimum. At this angle of incidence, the light will excite surface plasmons, which are electrons in the outer orbitals of gold, inducing surface plasmon resonance and causing a dip in the intensity of the reflected light. As the thickness of the layer changes due to binding of the receptor, this angle will change and the shift in angle can be measured or if the detector is at a fixed angle, the change in the intensity of the reflected polarized light will be measured.
This is a measure of the thickness of the layer on top of the gold surface, thus a, th a measure of the binding of the receptor to the ligand. Why is the receptor flown over the chip rather than the ligand as in other assays as that we have seen? Well, the receptor or antibody is a high molecular weight molecule, so the change in layer thickness is bigger if the receptor binds to the immobilized ligand as if the receptor were immobilized and the ligand would bind, which is usually a small molecule. This is for sensitivity reasons, but both configurations are principally possible. This change in angle is shown here on the left side. As the thickness of the layer changes, or as the receptor binds, angle moves from A to position B. This can be measured in real time, in this case in seconds, leading to a kinetic binding curve shown on the right side. We have used the principle of surface plasmon resonance to measure the interaction between an antibody and an antigen. This was actually a genetically engineered antibody. The antibody binds to the antigen forming the complex. The dissociation constant as shown above is the ratio between the kinetic constant of the off rate K off divided by the kinetic constant for the on rate K on and is AB antibody times antigen concentration divided by the complex. A couple of measures can be obtained from such an SPR experiment. As already mentioned, we can measure the on rate and the off rate. As you can see, increase in the response, reaching then a steady state. And as the uh, solution is changed from receptor containing to receptor free, we can also measure the dissociation of the receptor of the ligand, or in this case the antibody from the antigen. As you can see on the right, there is some reversible point binding left. This could be due to binding to the gold layer or to other groups on the surface, so the chip needs to be cleaned. A third result that you can obtain is the steady state response level, which is related to the amount of ligand that is bound to the immobilized antibody in this case, or antigen to the antibody. You can see as we increase the concentration of the antigen, the steady state level goes up. This is actually equivalent to the normal ligand binding assays under equilibrium conditions. As shown before, these steady state response levels can be plotted against the concentration of antibody here from 25 to 150 nanomolar, leading to the well-known saturation binding curve, which can be transformed with the sketcher transformation and linearized to obtain the KD and the Bmax values. Let's conclude with some applications of immuno and receptor assays, which are many. Some of them you will be introduced during this course. First of all, the bioanalysis of biopharmaceuticals. As briefly mentioned, biopharmaceuticals are based on proteins, meaning on macromolecules. Most of the biopharmaceuticals are measured using sandwich ELISA assays in complex biological samples such as blood serum or blood plasma. It is important to follow the concentration of biopharmaceuticals and to determine their pharmacokinetic parameters. Therapeutic drug monitoring, introduced by Professor Tao in Chapter 8, is also very much using immuno and receptor assays, ligand binding assays in general. I mentioned a few examples, for example, toxic substances that need to be quickly determined using the EMIT assay, or other drug molecules and metabolites of drugs that need to be monitored, for example, in oncology or in the field of immunosuppressants. Clinical chemistry is also a large user of ligand binding assays. Many biomarkers are measured 
with immunoassays to determine their concentration and to try to relate them to disease development and response to therapy. But the application of ligand binding as it goes much further. Industry uses them for high throughput screening in the drug discovery field. Here the mix and measure homogeneous assays are very popular because they can be easily automated and put on large robotic platforms. The pharmacokinetics already mentioned above are important in drug development to see what is the half-life of a drug, how fast is it metabolized. Toxicology screening is also very important and immuno and receptor assays are used in that context as shown in this chapter already. And finally doping tests, at least the first set, rely on immu uh, immunoassays, on quick assays that can be performed on site before samples are then transferred to the lab for maybe more in-depth analyses by liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. So this shows to you that ligand binding assays really have a very important place in bioanalysis and millions of such assays are performed every year around the world. In summary, these are the points that sh you should know and should be aware of. Ligand binding assays depend on equilibrium binding. They are usually characterized by saturation binding curves and the data can be transformed by the scattered analysis. Please rehearse the steps needed for the sketcher transformation and please remember how the dissociation constant and the Bmax can be determined. You should understand the principle of direct and competitive assays as well as of heterogeneous and homogeneous assays. Immunoassays and receptor assays are the two main platforms of ligand binding assays, especially immunoassays are widely used. So you should know how the generation of antibodies is done, both polyclonal and monoclonal, and how recombinant receptors can be obtained. Finally, a large part of this chapter is about the various detection principles, going from chromogenic assays, fluorescent assays, chemoluminescent assays, and radio uh, isotope assays.